This video is sponsored by PCBWay.com. More on that in a while. Now, recently I did a video on emulating MIDI synths for use with Atari, and there's a link to that video up in the description. That got me to thinking, how can we get a real hardware synth to connect to a physical ST via MIDI cables for a reasonable price? We could spend hundreds, but who wants to do that? And the answer to that question is a mix of constructed hardware, some software, and a Raspberry Pi. So I was Googling around the subject when I came across the Bulky MIDI 32 project on GitHub, and that was created by the user Tebble, and that's Tor Eric Bake Lunde. I'm sorry for butchering your name, mate, I really am. The project looks really stylish. I love the way that it uses PCBs for the circuitry and also for the enclosure of the synth. The GitHub page had Gerber files for the project, but I did a search on PCBWay.com, I found a pre-canned project page for the build. So I did a four tops and I reached out to PCB Way to see if they'd like the help and they agreed. So all I had to do was choose my board color, add the project to my basket and submitted my basket. If you want to buy some PCBs and do this project yourself at home, there's a Black Friday sale going on at the moment, which morphs into a Christmas sale on December 1st. I'll put a link in the description to that sale page, but that's not an affiliate link, it's just a link. The packages arrived in very short order. I was quite impressed with that. And here we are, we're opening the package. We have a box. Opening up the box, we have a, <clears throat> an upside down box. Wait a second, I'll get the contents out. And we have a couple of freebies, some small stickers, a flipping huge one, and a pen. Now let you, <laughs> Let's watch me struggle to get the PCBs out from the shrink rack packaging. I mean, I'll zip past this and get to the boards themselves. I mean, I checked when I was looking at the video, it actually took me about four minutes just to get the boards out of the packaging. I mean, you know, these guys package like they mean the contents to stay packaged. Right, here are our PCBs. We have the main PCB, the control panel PCB, and then two boards that are structural. They're not for pushing electrons around. So we have the front panel or the fascia and the case top. So before we start building, it's time to give the PCBs a little bath in isopropyl alcohol just to clean off any factory residue. Then we'll stick the board in the old soldering camp and take a look at the first step of the build. Resistors are to be inserted here, down there, there, and finally at the bottom of the board. Now the resistor at the bottom of the board is the series resistor for the LED. So its value will determine how bright your LED is. So depending on your type of LED, you might want to up the value of this resistor to prevent light being too bright. But the LEDs that I use recommend a 220 ohm resistor. So I'm going to use the one that the board value recommends of 330 ohms to get a slightly dimmer light. We don't want to get blinded by the light. So I'll get the resistors in and I'll come back to you. I'm not going to show me soldering as I can't solder at a distance like the YouTube pros do. And I need to use magnifying goggles for my eyesight. So all you would actually see is the top of my baldy head, which probably is not what you want to see. Apologies for just how poorly those resistors were bent. Not my best work, I don't think. I'm going to buy one of these, so there'll be no excuses in the future. So next, we're going to add the diode D1 and the two sockets for our chips, making sure we put the notch in the sockets in the direction matching those on the board. And we'll also put the three ceramic capacitors in at this point. Those capacitors can be mounted in any direction, but obviously the diode has to be orientated correctly and the black strip on the diode needs to go with the black strip on the board. It's very easy. Next is the 40 pin connector for the Raspberry Pi and the two electrolytic capacitors. Now again, for these two capacitors, orientation is important. The strip down the side of the capacitor is the negative leg, if you like, and it goes into the matching hole in the PCB. The next two items to add are the connectors for the audio interface. This build uses a separate audio stage because the one built into the Pi is not really fit for purpose in what is after all a specialist audio project. So there's my pin headers soldered into place. And then next we solder the audio interface onto the board. But before we solder it into the board, we need to set some jumpers. Now the settings will depend on the type of audio interface that you buy. With all these things, I recommend getting the one listed in the bill of materials for the project from the GitHub link and double checking that it has the pins in the same order as this. Just makes it easier. So we set the jumpers by bridging the solder pads. And what we're looking to do is bridge them like this. 
So then we stick the board onto the pin headers and solder away. At this point, I'm going to add the two sockets for the MIDI connections, and these go here and here. And one thing to bear in mind is that there's some larger tabs to be soldered. I recommend sticking as much solder as you can on them because there could be a bit of stress on this connector from inserting and removing the MIDI cables, so it's worth bearing in mind. So once they're soldered, that's pretty much it for the main board for now. So let's focus on the front panel. And there are two parts to it. There's the circuit board and the fascia plate. The circuit board goes in here and there are tabs to align it with both the bottom and the top and the fascia panel sits in front of it. Let's get to building this. We'll start by adding the right angle connector to that board and that is the one that mates to the main board to join the two up. Now it's important to note here that this is added to the other side of the board so not the component side, the other side. And as usual to make it easy on yourself, solder one pin, check that it's flush to the board before you actually solder the rest. And here's the result. And then next we add the standoffs that connect the fascia to the circuit board. Now the GitHub instructions do recommend trimming the standoff to make assembly easier, so I did that. I'm not sure if I needed to or not, but hey, we follow the instructions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dry fit the components on the circuit board, and we have two momentary contract switches, a rotary encoder, and an LED. Now the LED's orientation is important. The longer leg goes into the circular pad towards the top of the board. Now we put the front panel on and fix it in place. Now instead of using screws, I use four of the standoffs and I make those standoffs long enough to clear the rotary encoder. And the reason for that is I can, when I solder it, I'll just turn it upside down and use those standoffs as kind of a stand. Before soldering, we make sure that everything's aligned correctly and that the LED is aimed through the hole the light comes through. Once our components are aligned, we can just solder them. Now there are two sets of jumpers on the circuit board here. The set to the left are there to control the direction of the rotary encoder. And for that, we need the short pins one and two on both. Pin one has a little triangle next to it, but you have to be aware that two sets of jumpers are not orientated the same way. So it's the uh, top two pads on the left jumper and the bottom two on the right one. So after bridging the pads, I do a simple beep test to make sure that we only have the shorts we actually want. And before we get to fitting the display, there are two more jumpers that need setting over on the right hand side of the circuit board. They specify what order the pins are on the display board itself. So as I did with the audio interface, my display has the same pinouts as the one shown on GitHub. So I short the following two pins. And once I've done that, I'll do another continuity test and then we'll look to insert the display. Your display may or may not come with pin headers already attached, mine did. So it's just a case of removing the fascia panel, sticking the display board pins into the circuit boards, putting the fascia panel back on. Right, then as we have done for the other things like this, we'll tack a single pin, double check the alignment, inveigle the position, maybe have to melt the solder, and then once we're happy with it, we can commit to soldering the rest. It's time to remove the standoffs from the fascia plate and replace them with screws. We're going to use those standoffs to separate the bottom and top plates of the bulky MIDI. But instead of using screws to secure the standoffs into the bottom board, we're actually going to use another set of standoffs that will then form the feet of the device. So those standoffs need to be long enough to clear the face plate that projects down under the main PCB. From this picture, you can actually see the standoffs just peeking underneath the fascia on the bottom. So I, I just attach the top plate here just to make sure everything settles into a good place. Then I solder together the main PCB and the screen. And don't worry about the flux marks, they aren't real because the flux said it's no stain. So they can't be there, can they? Right, we're nearly done for soldering now. Let's stick the two discrete chips into the board. And after that, I add yet more standoffs for the pie to rest on. And then we insert the Raspberry Pi. And now you see the purpose of that huge gaping hole in the main board. That's where the Pi's USB connectors stick through. Finally, we screw the lid down and that's it. It's all over the software part of the build. And I did, of course, clean the flux off the main PCB with a bit of IPA and yeah, looks better, doesn't it? The software build is based on Dale Winham's MT32 Pi project. And this is a bare metal Pi project that sort of boots a minimalistic operating system and goes straight into the application. 
The MT32 Pi project is based on FluidSynth, which I covered in a previous video, the one on emulating MIDI, and I have a link to that in the description. So installing and configuring the MT32 Pi is really easy. So we download the release from the GitHub page, link of course in the description. I write that to a freshly formatted FAT32 SD card. Now the card doesn't really need to be that large. I mean, the distro itself is only 37 meg and probably you'll put a couple of sound fonts on top of that. So I would say even a four gig card would be sufficient. So we're gonna edit the config file to set things up. And that config file is not surprisingly called mt32-pi.cfg. Now, if you scroll through this file, you'll realize that the mt32pi does an awful lot more than we're gonna be using or describing in this video. I mean, it does things like it can receive MIDI streams over TCP IP, or it can host an FTP server to allow ROMs and sound fonts to be uploaded without having to disconnect the SD card. But for our usage, we're really just using the basics. So we only have a few things to change. To allow a faster boot, I'm gonna disable USB. If needed later, we can always enable it again, but I doubt we'll ever connect a keyboard or a mouse to this Pi. Because we're using separate audio, I'll set the output device to I2S. Uh, the default that is seen here, PWM, is the built-in audio jack, which, as I said before, not very good quality audio. There are two control schemes supported on the MT32 Pi. The first uses four buttons, and the second two buttons on a rotary encoder. So we're gonna set the latter as our scheme. And then there are two settings we need to fiddle with to get our display working. We set the LCD type to SH1106 underscore I2C. And we set its height to 64 pixels. And that's all she wrote for config. For the MT32 Pi to operate, it needs a copy of the original MT32 firmware. Now this can be extracted from that real MT32 that you actually own. Yeah, you've got one of them, so you can just do that. Or well, copies of these ROMs can be found via the medium of search. Once you've located your ROMs, extract them into the ROMs folder of the MT32Pi distribution on your SD card. Now for sound fonts, you can see here that the default distribution comes with the sound font already installed. So for the purposes of the video, we'll just use that. We're done building. We're done configuring software. Let's go test. If you know this channel, you know how this test is going to go down. So we're going to connect our bulky MIDI 32 to one of my Atari STs. Here we're using an STFM. Because the ST has native MIDI support, we only need a single MIDI cable to hook the two up. Yeah, if you're doing this on a PC, you, you will need some form of an adapter cable. I think Roland do one. I'm going to plug this in and let you see how fast it boots. And as you can see, the answer is pretty fast. So now I'm going to boot the ST. I'm going to switch on my trusty old Altec Lansing speakers and We'll fast forward through the boot and execution of the Sweet 16 sequencer. Right, so the audio that you're about to hear is going to come through the camera's mic rather than the lav mic that I'm wearing. But I wanted you to hear the sound as it comes out the speakers. Oh, and also I forgot to turn off the overhead lights, so this footage is really, really grainy. I, I am sorry. Okay, so the first sound you're going to hear is the MT32 native voice from the firmware. <laughs> Then I hit button one to swap to the sound font. And I love the fact that the display on the MT32 and the sequencer are matched. I mean, I don't know why. It'd be an absolutely huge problem if they weren't, but I, uh, little things make me happy. Okay, this was a really fun build to do. I think the soldering and the construction took four or five hours. It was not a, not a difficult build by any means, but it, it was just a lot of fun to do. And what I got out of it was a functional MIDI synth that sounds great and that I can use for years to come. So credits go to Tebble for the board design, Dale Winham for the MT Pi 32 project, and to PCB Way for the PCBs. Now I hope you enjoyed this video, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.